most cherished birthright. But what if your freedom was suddenly removed because of your religious beliefs? What if you were forced to participate in practices that directly conflicted with your faith? What if your church was targeted for discrimination because of its beliefs? What if your foundational freedoms were taken away? At Alliance Defending Freedom, we share a belief, a fundamental truth, that people have the God-given, constitutionally guaranteed right to freely live out their faith. And that freedom, that truth, must be defended. But what if the sun was beginning to set on the foundational freedoms upon which our nation was built? Now, more than ever, those very freedoms and values we cherish are under fierce and relentless legal attack, being drawn into the shadows by those who are determined to silence people of faith and redefine the U.S. Constitution. And these challenges are more than simple legal skirmishes. They are ongoing battles for the soul of our nation. At Alliance Defending Freedom, we are pushing back the impending legal dusk that is fast approaching our nation. We are unwavering in our commitment to see a world whose laws affirm religious liberty, both publicly and privately, defend the preservation of marriage and the family, and protect the sanctity of life. We know that a good defense starts with a great offense, so we are reshaping the legal landscape through unique training programs that empower the lawyers of today and equip the leaders of tomorrow, all to build an enduring legal force that will secure religious freedom for generations to come. collective winning record of nearly 80%, Alliance Defending Freedom's proactive Global Alliance has thousands of faith-based attorneys in your cities, your courthouses, and your communities, ready to serve you today. We share a common hope for what tomorrow will look like in America, a free and just nation that we believe lies right on the horizon. The sun has not set on the values and freedoms that we all hold so dear. In fact, at Alliance Defending Freedom, we know that sun is just beginning to rise. We are Alliance Defending Freedom. For faith. For justice.
Good evening, friends, and, and welcome. It is, uh, it's a deed and honor to be here, and Pastor, thank you for opening your church to us. It is uh, not always that churches will allow uh, discussions of this sort to occur, and it takes a great deal of courage and confidence on the part of the pastor and on the part of the Board of Elders and the people who open up these venues to hashtag productions to have conversations about faith and politics, uh, which I find deeply admirable. And uh, for reasons, especially tonight, uh, on Monday, uh, our, our next speaker, Ross Douth, that the New York Times and I were talking on the radio about a variety of religious freedom issues. And uh, I did not know the name of the mayor of Houston. Uh, I did not know of the ordinance in Houston. I didn't know anything about Houston other than uh, we got their uh, second string running back by the name of Ben Tate to come to Cleveland and he was doing a good job for the Browns. That's what I knew about Houston. And then on Tuesday, uh, there erupted a controversy about which we will be speaking a lot tonight, which is actually not new, it's very old. Uh, but it's also been rather resolved in this country until recently. Between 1776 and 1789, 13 colonies wrote themselves state constitutions. 11 of them included within it specific free exercise protection that covered not just rights of conscience, but rights of action extensively detailed, extensively studied and researched by scholars. There is a little bit of debate. I cannot say that there is not some challenge, but the prevailing view is articulated by Professor Mike McConnell, a longtime judge on the Tenth Circuit, is that those framers intended to cover action uh, motivated by free exercise, provided it was consistent with the public safety. That you could, in fact, exercise your freedom of, of, of religion, provided that, and, and protect your conscience, provided that you did not pick another man's pocket, as it was put in John Locke's letter of toleration from 100 years earlier, or in any way disrupt by untoward behavior or licentiousness or other kind of immorality, the good public order upon which all freedom ultimately depends in ordered liberty. So much was this assumption taken for granted that in 1813, DeWitt Clinton, one of the great framers who people don't know much about because he was an anti-federalist, governor of New York, one-time presidential candidate, mayor of New York, was sitting uh, as the writing justice in a case out of the New York highest court called People versus Phillips. And the question there was, uh, uh, Mr. Phillips had had property taken, uh, Mr. Phillips had stolen property, actually, and he had returned it to the priest who had returned it to the individual from whom it was stolen in the course of the confessing to the priest that he had done it. This is all now surmised. And the priest was called by the state of New York to testify about who had stolen the property that he had returned, the assumption being it was Mr. Phillips. The priest would not testify. He would not break the seal of the confessional, which is, for those who are Roman Catholic here, understood to be sacred and absolutely essential, a sacrament of the Roman Catholic Church. And DeWitt Clinton, not a Catholic by any means, wrote a powerful exposition on the fact that if one removes the sacrament and the ability for the pastors of churches to pastor as they understood they are led to pastor, you will break the fundamental freedom about which this country was organized. And there was not any debate. There were five early cases before it became a federal issue after the Civil War and the incorporation of the First Amendment via a long and boring legal process that I won't talk to you about tonight. But the majority of opinions stood for the free exercise, vigorous and vibrant. It was not really assumed, with the exception of the Mormon cases, which came about because of the breach with the Judeo-Christian understanding concerning polygamy. That was the only assumption, the only breach until after the Second World War. But from the Second World War to this point, there has been a steady growing conflict as government has grown and as the culture has changed with the ability to freely practice your religion and to hold to your rights of conscience as this country clearly understood them. And I have in front of me a long list of cases. I wish it were not so long. The Alliance Defending Freedom has been deeply involved with uh, over the last many years, cases that unfortunately you shouldn't have to know about. Elaine photography, you shouldn't have to know about Liberty Ridge Farms, you shouldn't have to know about Masterpiece Cake Shop, you shouldn't have to know about pharmacists in Washington State, the Stormans, who've had a four-generation family pharmacy. You shouldn't have to know these names or the cases which surround them that the Alliance Defending Freedom has been uh, bringing forward the rights of conscience 
to resist the cultural demand for conformity on the issue of same-sex marriage. And this is not about uh, being hostile to gays, lesbians, and it's not. It's about people exercising their understanding of what God calls them to do in the workplace. And we're working our way through this. But those are cases that ADF has been at the forefront of, and we won a big one, that the Alliance Defending Freedom was right at that front table, Hobby Lobby. And that was an enormous win in June of this year where the Supreme Court said, of course, employers who are motivated by conscience and who run their businesses in, co in concert with those conscious and their understanding of the revealed wisdom of God, of course, they may not be obliged by the government to do that which is inevitably going to cause them to rupture with their understanding of faith. And it was an enormous win and the left hated it. Oh, does the left hate Hobby Lobby. The idea that the free exercise clause is alive and well, even though this is a statutory case about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, it was based upon an idea of the Congress of, of, of the time that passed RIFRA that one would not impose any undue burden unless absolutely necessary upon a group of like-minded believers. So Hobby Lobby was a big win. And so some people relaxed and we applauded ADF. And I applaud you for applauding ADF and coming out tonight, but it was a temporary win. And this week in Houston, I believe is a Waterloo moment to set the stage for what has happened in Houston. You have to understand what I did not understand as of Monday. An equal rights ordinance was passed. These are generally not of the sort that give much people pause. They are rather routine and all over the United States. But this one has within it the bathroom provision in which men who believe themselves to be women or women who believe themselves to be men and are transgendered are empowered to use the restroom of their choice in accordance with their sexual identity as they understand it. Needless to say, it was controversial within Houston as it is controversial everywhere because many people, indeed I think a supermajority of Americans, draw on their mind a distinction between the issues surrounding sexual orientation and same-sex marriage and the transgendered issue and the issues of privacy that go with uh, the most private of bodily functions. And so the people of Houston self-organizing using three of their rights in the First Amendment, the right of free speech, the right to petition the government for redress of grievances, and their free exercise rights, co collected 50,000 signatures and presented it to the City Council of Houston and demanded that the City Council of Houston put that ordinance before the people of Houston for a vote. And through legal chicanery, and I will call it nothing but that, because I've been doing election law a long time, you don't go from 50,000 signatures to below the needed 19,000 plus unless you're throwing out stuff left, right, and center, and unless you're acting in a corrupt fashion to protect an unpopular ordinance pushed by a small minority of voters and by an activist mayor who believes deeply that this is important. Don't ask me why, I had never heard of Anise Parker until this week, and I wish her well. In fact, I would gonna urge everyone on my show tomorrow, I'm gonna to urge every Christian in America, every pastor to send her flowers. I would just love for you tonight to go home and start sending flowers to City Hall in Houston and say thank you for your public service, but please do not persecute and prosecute the pastors of Houston because that is what she did in order to intimidate, to stigmatize, to make sure that every pastor in America got a message, Anise Parker and her general counsel subpoenaed them in a lawsuit that did not involve them. Let me tell you what happened after they disqualified that ordinance. What did they do? The people who had worked hard to put that ordinance before the voters sued and argued that what you had done, city of Houston, was illegal and corrupt. Now that's an issue of fact-finding for the court to resolve. They'll dig into whether or not those signatures ought to have been disqualified, and they'll have a courtroom battle over that. But in a means to intimidate pastors who had spoken out against the ordinance, the attorneys for the city of Houston subpoenaed five pastors who are not parties to the litigation. They are not named members of the cast, but they had believed in the mind of the Houston city attorneys and Anise Parker been in favor of the referendum. Now, a subpoena is a bad thing to get on the best of days. It costs money the moment you open it. And I want to stress this to you. It's a damaging thing. I can intimidate people. I've been practicing law since 1983. And whenever my clients get a subpoena or a summons, it's a bad day because they have to call me. And rarely do I work for free. Rarely. 
And so you start that clock going. But more than that, you've got a target on your back, and you know you're going to go get sworn. And guess what? As George Washington said in his farewell address, oaths matter. In the United States and most of the states of the Union, and certainly in the federal uh, United States Code, it is a felony to lie under oath. So you go in harm's way when you're under oath. If you make a mistake, it can be misunderstood. So they subpoena these pastors for all of their sermons and all of their private discussions concerning homosexuality and the ordinance and the mayor. Most intimidating thing I've ever seen. Now, two discussions have erupted in the aftermath of this. That night, when it became a controversy because Fox News covered it, and I began to cover it on my show, and by the next day it had been picked up by Rush, and Sean Hannity did a terrific job, and people are all over this story. They're all over this story like they were all over the Benham Brothers story. When Janet Mefford, where is Janet right here, one of Dallas's finest citizens, I hope you're all listening to Janet every single day. Uh, when Janet picked up on that story, all of a sudden the media converge. The night before the media converge, Nice Parker tweeted out, pastors and their sermons are fair game she put on her Twitter feed. Yesterday, she held a backpedaling press conference where she said, oh, perhaps it was overbroad. I didn't know it was in it. The night before, she said, pastors and their sermons are fair game. Most of mainstream media has not picked up on this yet. The night before, before she realized that most of America thinks this is abhorrent to go after pastors, no matter what they preach, if they are preaching, and that the, the solemnity of that confessional first defended in 1813 lives on in this church and in every church in America. You do not invade it, government. You do not come here. And the Alliance Defending Freedom has stood up and they have moved to squash that subpoena and your next governor, and this is not a political speech, it's simply an objective reading of the polls, Greg Abbott, who's your current attorney general, sent them a letter yesterday saying, withdraw the subpoena, it's an outrage. And I am quite certain that the Alliance Defending Freedom will win that case, but that it has to be won, that we have to go through this argument ought to shock the conscience of every American who believes in liberty. At this moment in the Middle East, Christians are dying for their faith. ISIS is beheading and rampaging through not just Christian communities, but Yazidi communities and different sects. If you're not, that is the opposite of religious liberty. And you would think at this day and in this place especially that Americans of whatever political belief would stand for the right to disagree deeply but to nevertheless honor the religious beliefs of all Americans. Thus has it always been so. Thus it was intended by the framers of our First Amendment. So much so it was assumed to be in the Constitution but the Anti-Federalists insisted that it be added in the Bill of Rights. And so I hope everyone here tonight, as we hear people talk about religious liberty in these variety of cases, continue to support the Alliance Defending Freedom and their efforts to keep free the pastors, not just of Houston, but of every city and every state in the Union. And indeed, not just in the United States, but to stand up and assure that religious liberty is a value about which the United States can be as proud as it is today as it was in 1776 forward. Thanks for being here tonight, one of the most important voices in the United States right now, on subjects of this sort, writes for, well, he writes for the New York Times. It's really remarkable. I asked him on the drive over here how he snuck in there, and it's an interesting story for another time, but it's good to have one of ours there. He's sort of like the special forces of conservative punditry, because he's working behind enemy lines. And God loved the New York Times, but they're not exactly receptive to our points of view, at least to the points of view of most of the people in the room tonight. So please join me in welcoming really one of America's most talented writers. If you haven't read Bad Religion, his bestseller, you ought to. Uh, New York Times columnist, Ross Douthat. Ross? All right, good evening. Thanks so, so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having you. Thanks for having these guys. Um, maybe they're supposed to be hiding behind the stage and you aren't supposed to look over there. But anyway, um, it's great to be here and I'm just gonna talk for a few minutes um, about sort of how we got here. Um, how we ended up having the kind of debates over religious liberty and the free exercise of religion that Hugh was talking about that we've seen in the Hobby Lobby case, that we've seen in a lot of the cases surrounding same-sex marriage and florists and bakers and everything else, um, and also that we've seen in sort of other dimensions, like the University of California statewide system pushing groups like InterVarsity off state university campuses. There's been a lot of sort of pressure around religious groups on campuses, not only in California, but Vanderbilt, um, Bowdoin College in Maine and elsewhere. So there's a lot, of, a lot of sort of stuff going on around this set of issues. And I think 
it's sort of useful to step back and think a little bit about sort of cultural change and the cultural changes that we've that have gotten us here, uh, because I think one of the tendencies among religious believers and particularly conservative religious believers is to see what we're talking about here is just a story about secularism, basically, that this is a story about sort of secular forces, secular elites, maybe you hear those words, you think of some of my friends at the New York Times, I'm not sure, um, but secular forces and secular elites sort of just pushing religion gradually out of the public square as in debates about school prayer and other debates down to the present. And that is part of the story. Um, there is a fairly secular intellectual elite in American life. Again, I, I know some of them. They're my dear friends. Um, but part of the story, too, is a story about religious change. And I was listening to Hugh talk, and he, when he was talking about the debates about Mormonism and polygamy in the late 19th century, Hugh talked a little bit about the Judeo-Christian consensus and the idea that the debate about Mormonism and polygamy was sort of an exception to the rule that politics stopped at the church door because polygamy was, was outside a consensus. It was something that maybe in the uh, language of DeWitt Clinton was some kind of threat to public order in a, way that, um, in a way that other religious practices weren't. And I think what we've seen in the United States over the last 50 or 60 years is a religious change that isn't really secularization. It's not a change where the country has ceased to be religious where people have ceased to believe in God, where people have ceased to be interested in spiritual issues and ideas. What we've seen instead is the breakdown of a religious consensus. The breakdown of a consensus that was pretty much Protestant, and I'm a Roman Catholic, so I can say that, pretty much Protestant at the beginning, and then gradually encompassed um, Catholicism and Judaism as well, so that people started using a phrase like Judeo-Christian. And it was a consensus that was associated with very strong institutional religion in the U.S., very strong Protestant denominations, eventually a strong and flourishing Roman Catholic Church. And the story of the last 50 years is a story of increasing institutional weakness and of the disappearance of that consensus. And what that has meant is that both institutional religion in general and traditional Christianity, sort of small o orthodox Christianity, and I'm, you know, putting an umbrella around most Protestant churches, my fellow Catholics, the Orthodox as well. Um, traditional Christianity has ended up being more marginal in American life than it would have been several generations ago. And the religious center in America has become a kind of spiritual I don't want to use the word mush, but I'm going to use the word mush, a kind of spiritual mush in a way, where people have some sort of vague spiritual beliefs, maybe they're affiliated in some way with one church or another, but they're more likely to get their ideas about God and the universe and the meaning of human life from an Oprah Winfrey than they are from their pastor or their bishop. And what that has meant in turn is that it's become possible for people in positions of power and influence and so on to look at traditional Christianity and see an outlier and see a force that maybe, depending on where we're headed right now, is in the same position relative to the cultural consensus or what they hope the cultural consensus would be as the Mormons were in the 19th century. And I think that that is actually a really useful way for traditional Christians to think about what the people on the other side of these debates are thinking. Because the people on the other side of these debates do not think of themselves as anti-religious. They don't think of themselves as just trying to push religion to the margins of American life. They see themselves as crusaders against a particular set of ideas, most of them associated with New Testament sexual ethics right now. Um, and, you know, Gay marriage is the flashpoint, but as you could see in the Hobby Lobby case, it's a much broader range of issues, most of them connected to sex in one way or another. And they see themselves as applying a reasonable kind of pressure on religious conservatives to ease conservative Christianity in the historically appropriate direction on issues like same-sex marriage, on issues like unisex bathrooms, um, and on whatever the next issue will be tomorrow. And so to them, this story isn't a story about 
violating the First Amendment. It isn't a story about sort of pushing God out of American society. They might be secular, they might be religious, but they're fine with the idea of religion defined as something that involves, you know, praying, going to church on Sunday, doing charitable works, and so on. They just think that there are particular ideas about sex and marriage and so on that are as backward and pernicious in their eyes as polygamy, which the Republican Party platform described as one of the relics of barbarism, right, in the 1850s. They see certain elements of Christian sexual teaching as a relic of barbarism, and they think it's okay not to move towards any kind of persecution, anything remotely like what, you know, what we would think of when we use a word like persecution. They think of it as okay to apply social pressure, some legal pressure, and just some strong cultural pressure of the kind that, you know, was brought to bear on, on um, a certain television network that was thinking about doing a TV show starring a couple of guys who were connected to people who had preached on some of these topics. So that, that I think, is just a useful way to sort of set the stage for the conversation we're about to have, to sort of see the way these debates look from the other side, which sees, sees two things happening. It sees America as having changed in ways that make sort of a Judeo-Christian consensus kind of an anachronism, kind of a dead letter, and they see themselves as being in possession of ideas that are simply correct and forward-looking and humane and tolerant in a way that traditional Christian ideas aren't, and they see themselves sort of in the process of, in a way, in a way helping conservative Christians. And I think that that, that, is, that is an important thing to keep in mind, that yes, there are obviously people involved in these debates who are genuinely hostile to organized religion, genuinely hostile to Christianity, but there are also just a lot of people involved in these debates who would say, look, you, we put a lot of pressure on the Mormons in the 19th century, and they got rid of polygamy, and they're doing great. And in a hundred years, when you are, when your churches are blessing gay marriages, and when your businesses are paying for contraception and the morning after pill, and IUDs and so on, and when the abortion debate isn't a controversy anymore, and when all these debates aren't controversies anymore, you'll be doing fine, and you'll thank us for having nudged you in the historically correct direction. Um, so that's sort of a frame to put on the conversation that I think sometimes, um, sometimes conservatives and Christians don't necessarily see the world through, uh, but I think it's useful to keep in mind. And with that, I'll give it back to Hugh. I've thought a lot of, no, I've, I've, I've actually thought a lot about um, both the Mormons and our own Catholic Church, because I wrote a column about this, um, I guess it was when the Hobby Lobby case had just been decided. And the column was about, it was called something like a company liberals should love. And it was sort of a case for why Hobby Lobby being a good corporate citizen that pays its workers very well, it's actually been praised by left-wing groups for the wages that it pays and so on. And so it started out talking, making that case, and then it segued into talking about pluralism and free exercise and so on. But in, in the course of that, I sort of mentioned these exceptions. I said, you know, America has a long tradition of religious tolerance, but Obviously, you know, we put a lot of pressure on the Mormons, and there was a lot of conflict between Protestants and Catholics. And the conflict between Protestants and Catholics was over, again, sort of Protestants in the 19th century looked at the Catholic Church, looked at things that the 19th century popes were saying, and said, we're not sure Catholicism is compatible with the democratic order. And, uh, you know, as, as a Catholic, I think a lot of the arguments that Protestants made back then were, you know, bigoted and nativist and wrong, but it was also the case that the Protestants sort of had a point, that if you just went by some things some popes were saying, there did seem to be a tension. And one of the things that happened over the next 70 years was that partially under the influence of American Catholics, the Catholic Church in Rome became friendlier to religious liberty, became friendlier to some of the basic ideas behind the American founding. And so after thinking about that, thinking about sort of the Mormons, thinking about that Catholic-Protestant conflict, it just, it struck me that this, I, I don't think they frame it that way, but this is sort of how a lot of liberal critics of conservative Christianity see the dynamic that, right now. That's a very big idea. We're going to come back to that because I think that might be a, in the DeWitt Clinton opinion, 
Not only did he mention polygamy, he mentioned, should the Inquisition come here? Then we will well, there, fight. There you that, go. And so there was, that's a fascinating construct. And we're still working on that. Yeah, we, you know, but, but it's been postponed for a it's while. It's been postponed. So. Now I want, to, I want to elaborate though with the help of uh, audiovisual aids here at video because what uh, Ross and I are pundits. We observe and sometimes I litigate, but mostly I observe and I teach what's going on and Ross writes about it. Some people live this pressure, which is not persecution, but it's definitely costly. And let's roll a video to show you what our next guests actually have lived. I'm Jason Benham. My name's David. Oh no, I set off the alarm. Every day, we do CrossFit wads. And he and I compete with each other and I usually beat him. The empty wagon always rattles the loudest. Of a media firestorm. Christian so there's David and Jason Benham. One Twitter message. Yeah. Jason, aren't you upset with HGTV? Report. There's David and Jason Benham. Jason Benham and David Benham. Who hold to traditional values? Well, I don't, I don't want to get into speech. Why do your hearts go out to them? If our faith costs us a television show, then so be it. The war on traditional values. Liberal activists demanded the network pull the plug on the show. The twins say their beliefs cost them the show. Now, a country founded on freedom of religion and freedom of speech faces fundamental questions. You guys feel as if you are willing to lose everything if you're standing up for what you believe in. You were fired for having an opinion. Well, we weren't fired for having an opinion. We were fired for voicing an opinion. We let them know that we love Jesus and we love people. Jesus loves all people, but he does not love all ideas. That there is an agenda. What an agenda will do. Seeks to silence, silence the voices of men and women of faith, those that disagree with it. Go get your torches and pitchforks. HGTV is about to give a show to some Christians. There's an agenda that's out in America right now that demands silence, especially from men and women who profess Jesus Christ. Okay. Jason, aren't you upset with HGTV? That's okay, we're not victims. We live from the inside out. We don't live from the outside in. We don't need media, we don't need other people to tell us how to live. We live from the inside out. We remember we were 12 years old when we prayed to receive Jesus into our heart. And I can remember our dad said, guys, when you give your heart to the Lord, you've now entered the battle between good and evil. But when you make your peace with God, you declare war on the devil. The message for this critical hour is that love looks like something. Love lays its life down whatever the cost. Love runs toward the bullets and does not run away and duck for cover. Now is the time for Christians to stand boldly for Jesus, whatever the cost. Please welcome the Benham Brothers. Thanks, guys. Well, I just, I'm David, the good brother. I'm, I'm the one, I'm the reason why HGTV came to us in the first place. He was, is the empty wagon, and I can tell you, Janet, thank you for getting us fired, by the way. It was his mouth that's always gotten us in trouble. And in Janet walked him right into that one. In 2012, I did an interview with Janet right after we hosted a citywide prayer service called Charlotte 714. And we did it in the spirit of 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. How many of you want this land to be healed? I want it to be healed. And it starts with God's people. So we had this prayer service. Now we're real estate guys. And by the way, I just want you to know if God can use Jason, he can use any of us. So just let's be encouraged tonight. We've read the end of the book. We are filled with hope, but we know it's going to cost us something. But I just want to say we had a prayer service in 2012 called Charlotte 714. It was the night before the Democratic National Convention came to Charlotte, North Carolina. And I don't know if you remember what happened the opening day of the DNC when they removed God from the platform and Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. You remember all the boos? And I mean, it was just crazy. And I can remember Fox and Friends called us and said, would you give a comment? And I said, Judges chapter 5, verse 8. When new gods were chosen, chaos came to the gates. And it's very interesting. So we had this prayer service the night before. Fox did not do the interview after they did. said After that. they heard that, they were like, yeah, <laughs> I think we'll go to some other person. So, but um, anyway, so we had this prayer service the night before. 
And 9,000 Christians showed up, 150 churches. We got on our faces before God, and we repented, and we got specific about sins. I mean, we can sit here and say, God bless America, and I want God to bless America. But when we have the blood, the innocent blood of 60 million baby boys and girls, we might want to repent of that as a nation. And, and you could continue. We, we begin to touch the covenants of God in marriage and these other things. So we prayed and asked God to forgive us, and my microphone's going in and out. And, and it was in that context that I talked about the radical homosexual agenda that is devastating this nation and that comes to seek, to rob, to kill, and to destroy. And, and, and I continued to talk about it. I said, first, sin and this agenda, it fascinates. Then it begins to assimilate, permeate, dominate. But its ultimate goal is to assassinate. And that's exactly what we see in the culture, and that's what happens in our own personal lives with sin. So Janet Medford has me on a radio show, and I just spoke just as, I spoke my heart out and had no idea Right Wing Watch was listening, and that's when they introduced America to the right wing bigoted views of David and Jason Benham. They are pro-life and they are pro-marriage. Well, it had no impact on us at all. It was not really much analysis other than just stating our comments. Fast forward a year and a half, actually fast forward about three months after that, a production company reaches out to us and says, you guys would be great on television. Now they were talking to me and I said, well, I've got a twin brother. So we had an interview with them. Three interviews later, after they saw our wives, they said, we're doing a sizzle clip on you guys. And they sent it to Los Angeles. Five networks wanted us. TLC made us our first offer. It was really exciting. We were so pumped thinking, Lord, I can't believe it. We just had a prayer service the night before the DNC out in public speaking your truth, and now you're giving us a platform. This is amazing. We had no idea that God was setting this thing up only to have it jerked right out from underneath us. We were actually supposed to premiere this Sunday. HGTV came in, gave us a, a, an incredible offer. They went and did a background search on Jason and I. They found the Janet Medford interview. Thank you, Janet, again. They found the Right Wing Watch article. They found some videos of us speaking about abortion, speaking about marriage and homosexuality and, and all of these things in the context of true biblical Christianity, not fire breathing and Bible thumping, but in the spirit of true genuine repentance and humility. And if God can give that to guys like us, he can give it to anybody. And so they found this and then HGTV contacted us and said, are you guys anti-gay? And we said, well, we're not anti-anybody, we're pro-Jesus. And we also believe that there are behavioral choices that we all make that are not godly, they don't honor God. As a matter of fact, they defame what God gives us so that we can have flourishing on this earth and honor him with our lives, you, you name it, and, and we continued. And they said, okay, no problem. And so then they made us an offer. So we begin pre-production. We're eight, nine months into this, and they contacted us and said, okay, we're about to announce your show at the Upfronts in New York City. Now, Upfronts, they go to Los Angeles, Chicago, Dallas, Boston, and the big ones in New York City. And they said, we're going to announce your show in, in New York City, and all of our advertisers are going to be there. And um, we just wanted you guys to know that we're going to be doing that at th the end of April. So they announce our name at the upfronts in the end of April. Well, we get a phone call two days later. Our show producer is, is I mean, he can barely breathe on the phone. He's like, guys, um, we announced your show. Advertisers are calling in. Kia Motors called in. Disney World called in. This is really good, but I've got an issue. Well, what is it? Glad also called. And we knew what Glad was. Gla what, what's Glad? Gay, lesbian. Gay, lesbian Alliance Defense Fund. Okay. So, anyway, is it really Alliance Defense Fund? I believe so. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, anyway, Glad called, and then they said they wanted us to know of your views. Now, we had already crossed this bridge with HGTV, and we let HGTV know, hey, look, tell Glad we're not pushing any agenda. Now, I just want to say that, and we're going to go into a little bit more of the story here in a minute for a few minutes, but I want to give you one biblical context, and I want to give you a tweet. I just pushed it out, and you guys can retweet it if you want, and I'm going to give you a little Bible story that helped us. It'll be just a few minutes, but I want to give you this tweet first. Are you ever going to let me talk? Yeah, in just a minute. Just okay. hold on. Because I really feel like a doorknob. But you look like one. You guys are all staring at me, right? But like, he's the he one with the gonna cheese ball pocket Can you talk? Yeah, well, I don't have a snaggle tooth. Thank you. You have a snaggle tooth. Okay. When your convictions come in conflict with the culture, will you capitulate 
or take courage. And where do we get that from? Our high school football coach and Bible teacher, Ronnie Littleton, is here. Ronnie, where are you? Raise your hand. There's Ronnie Littleton right there. He and our dad challenged my brother and I when we were 18 years old to start reading through the entire Bible. So by this time, we have read, now this is our 20th year through the scripture, we have read the story of Daniel 20 times. And when this situation came to us, we remember Daniel. As a young man, Daniel, it says, he purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's food. So he was in Babylonian culture, which was far worse than America. And, but yet he purposed in his heart he was not going to be affected by the culture. And then just a few chapters later, it's interesting, as Daniel is now a leader in Babylon, his convictions came on a direct collision course with the culture. And you remember what happened? There was an injunction that was written that the king stamped that said, no man for 30 days can pray to anyone but the king, lest you be thrown in the lion's den. And Daniel chapter 6 says, when Daniel read the entire ordinance, he went up into his room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, and he knelt to pray as was his custom. He didn't have to change anything. He was just going to be the same man that he had purposed in his heart to be years prior to that. You know, he knew he was going to get thrown into that lion's den, but he wasn't about to bow. And in our story, even though we were afraid for a moment, we had purposed in our heart, we are going to serve Jesus Christ, whatever the cost. Let me, let me just interrupt you there. Uh, otherwise, I'll never get an opportunity to say anything. But... Uh, See, everybody got an opportunity to see my brother and I stand. And we, you know what? We give God all the credit for that. I'm a coward. He's more of a coward than I am. When I played baseball, we both played professional baseball. I was with Baltimore. He was with Boston. We ended up with St. Louis. I voluntarily walked away from the game. He couldn't hit a curveball to save his life. That's how he got out of the game. But in high school, back when we played at Garland Christian Academy, just up the road, I had a, a Bible verse written on my glove. It was Mark 14, 50. You know what that verse says? Then they all deserted him and fled. Then they all deserted him and fled. I'm reminded of Luke 22, after Jesus had already told Peter that you're gonna deny me, and Peter says, no way, there's no way I'm gonna deny you. And then when the rooster crows, Peter looks at Jesus, Jesus looks at him and they meet eyes. What do you think Peter felt like in that moment? I'm the biggest coward that's ever walked the face of the earth. A year before HGTV fired us, they had found the, the stuff that we had said with Janet here, and they had called us and said, guys, we want to sign you, but we're doing our background checks on you. Are you guys anti-gay? You want to know the very first thing that went through our minds? Fear. God, but we've got this great platform here. And if, and if we can just kind of be quiet and tone it down just a little bit, we're going to have this platform where mil millions of people, we're going to be in their homes and we're going to be able to tell people about Jesus and all these things. And in that moment, when they wanted to know, what do you believe about homosexual behavior and are we anti-gay? The very first thing that went through our minds was the same thing that went through Peter's when he was asked, are you one of them? It was the exact same thing. We had our Peter moment. And I want to tell you, in that moment, it lasted about 15 seconds. I wanted to say, no, and we'll never say anything ever again about gay marriage. We'll never say anything about abortion being murder. We won't say anything like that. We're with you guys 100%. By God's grace, the Holy Spirit got us past that one pretty quick. We said, no, we're not anti-anything. We're pro-Jesus, which makes us pro-Bible, which makes us pro-family. And so... But it was that moment that we experienced that. But do you know what, want to know what happened after we hung up the phone? There were a few videos of he and I talking boldly that we actually took down. Now I can hear your collective, oh. You know, we did that. You know why? Because we're cowards. That's why. Because in that moment, I became what Mark 14, 50 said. They all deserted him and fled. Of course, we put him back up in time. You know, the definition of a true friend is the, the one that knows the tune to your song and sings it back to you when you've forgotten its melody. So we had some friends that were like, guys, this is not who you are. And you know what? We straightened up our act pretty quick. 
And then a year later, of course, HG stuck with us. They knew that we weren't anti-anything. They knew we were pro-family guys and we're successful in business. And we were the kind of guys they wanted. And I cannot tell you how many bigwigs at HG said and already knew everything there was to know about us and said, you guys are the type of people we want on our network until they got bullied. And then everything changed. And that's why to this day, we don't have anything bad to say about HGTV. They got bullied, and when someone's getting picked on, you don't go look at the kid getting picked on. You look at the bully, and you go after him. So in that moment, though, when God tapped us on the shoulder and we got fired, we had already died to this platform. We had already died to this dream. We had already let it go a year before when we realized we're no better than Peter. We had our Peter moment. We died to that dream. So then when they fired us, we stood strong. And now you can see we have a platform speaking to you fine folks on an evening like this. We give God all the credit for that. And we want to encourage everybody. All you have to do is face your fear. That's it. That's all you have to do is face it. Because when you face it, God will fight it. You don't have to worry about the fight. All you got to do is turn around and say, I'm not backing down. We've read the end of the book. God's people win. Every single one of you win as well. And so that's our encouragement. We're going all over the country saying that to folks just like you. We're going to talk. We can talk. Sit let's, down, let's talk. gentlemen. Thank you. I, I, yeah, we all have a mic. I'm like. Now, I am, uh, in, in, in 1996, I did a series for PBS called Searching for God in America. And I began every conversation, whether it was Elder Neil Maxwell, the Mormon Church, or Chuck Colson, or Cecil Murray, your father, the Dalai Lama. We're not going to agree theologically. I began each conversation that way. So I'm quite certain that the differences from here to there on theology are extraordinary. And I'll bet they're extraordinary out here. By the way, uh, how many of you identify as a Catholic? How many identify as an evangelical? I see you both. How many are evangelical? How many are Jewish? You. And how many are atheists? Um, Come on, it's okay. Christopher Hitchens was my good friend and was on my show 70 times. There aren't any atheists in it? Okay. Well, with great theological differences. So I'm not going to ask this about theology. I'm going to ask this about a practicality. How does this end? Because this is not reconcilable. The vision of the left and the vision of Christianity broadly understood today, not in mainstream Protestantism, but in evangelicalism and Roman Catholicism, conservative variety, cannot be reconciled on the sexual ethic. So the Houston mayor is just the first time. You guys were pressured by a private sector company. It's their choice. They have the freedom to do that. Uh, they might have broken the contract, but they have the freedom. The government does not have the freedom to do what Mayor Parker did. But more Mayor Parkers are out there. So I'll start with you, Ross, and then, and then move down. How is this going to end? In the short term, it ends one of two ways. Um, I would expect that in the next year or so, two years, depending on sort of some, depending on what they're thinking, I guess, the Supreme Court sort of puts an end to the debate over same-sex marriage. Um, and we have same-sex marriage recognized in all 50 states. And at that point, I think it is possible that a certain amount of the energy that's driving a lot of the issues we're talking about sort of goes out of goes out of politics in a way because there are a lot of people who are really engaged and committed in this cause because they're really engaged and committed to legal recognized same-sex unions and they are i think less committed and engaged with the idea of making sure people they disagree with theologically don't have tv shows or putting pressure on religious colleges and institutions and so on. And so that, w when I say the energy goes out, it doesn't mean that there won't keep being cases like what's just happened in Houston, or there won't keep being cases like what happened at Vanderbilt or what's happened in the University of California system, but there'll be sort of sporadic cultural brush fires. They won't be a constant, they, the, the, it'll sort of, maybe the equilibrium will sort of look like what it is right now, Maybe there'll be a, f a little bit fewer, but the issue will sort of subside and the, the majority of people involved on the left and the center left with the push for same-sex marriage will say, okay, we've gotten this far, you know, we're a big country, we can sort of agree to disagree. The other scenario looks more like what happened with race and segregation, 
in with places like Bob, Yo Bob Jones University, basically, where there's a substantial effort to, again, not, you know, not have not have the government come into churches or take over pulpits or anything like that, but there's a substantial effort to tie tax exemptions, public subsidies, and everything else to private institutions having particular particular views on sexual ethics. And in that situation, you could have a scenario where most evangelical and Catholic schools end up in the position Bob Jones ended up in, where they couldn't take federal money and they could, you know, they're, they're just, there are a bunch of things that could happen or they could lose accreditation. This is what's happening potentially to Gordon College in Massachusetts. They're being invited to reconsider their requirement for students, which says no sex before marriage, which includes gay sex, which means, you know, you follow. Um, and it, they may not lose their accreditation, but that's been sort of raised. So. Again, even in scenario two, I think we're not, it's, it is, I have more pessimistic Christian friends who imagine a darker scenario even than that, but I think that that, that is sort of the most likely sort of very negative outcome for conservative religious institutions, that, the, that instead of having a sort of sporadic pressure with a larger truce, you get an attempt to really turn New Testament sexual ethics into a belief in the inequality of the races that sort of completely. As a detail for the audience, Gordon College accredits a lot of teachers, as do many Christian colleges across the United States. Uh, they are presently being denied student teaching positions if you come from Gordon College in a school district, they won't accept them. Uh, the accreditation uh, manifesto, if it spreads and if it is not ruled unconstitutional, which I think it is, will, will bankrupt um, most of the colleges that are uh, identifying as evangelical and serious Catholic in the United States. So it's, a, it's too deep to go into on the law, but it's a dark future for the public attachment to New Testament sexual ethics. Uh, he gave you an optimistic and a pessimistic. Which one do you think happens? <laughs> well, Jason and I are going bounce to this, bounce this back and forth more than likely because we we speak a lot to each other. I have to usually interpret what he but says. The thing is, we're not near as smart as you guys. We're not theologians, we're not politicians. Uh, but I will say this, we have a dominion struggle in the world right now. The Lord, he created the world good. He put Adam in the earth and he said, have dominion. Now Adam, by his silence, allowed dominion to come in. This is getting a little bit theological for you, but just follow me for a minute. Jesus comes as the second Adam and takes authority and dominion back at the cross. He strips authority from Satan. There is no dominion of Satan through Jesus Christ. They overcome him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, not loving their lives so much as to shrink from death. Yet unfortunately, the church, now that we have the keys to authority that Christ gives the Christian church, we give that dominion back by our silence. And so what we see now is a struggle for dominion. And one of the ways that we've lost dominion is because Christians, unfortunately, don't believe in the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign over all things. The Bible says in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, including government, entertainment, media, education, the legal system, everything, my finances, my sexuality, everything is under God. That is the key to that. That's why, so as history repeats itself, and it's not just a circle, it's a spiral, so it's always moving forward. And at every point in history, when we see this happen, where the struggle for dominion, does, the, does this agenda, this sexual anarchy agenda, does it want dominion? Take a look. Has it got dominion in government? Has it got dominion in entertainment? Has it got dominion, I mean, you name it, in the marketplace? Yes, absolutely it does. How does God get dominion back? If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and get on their face, I believe that if the Christian church gets on their face before God and repents of the sin that we have in our own ranks, and then we stand up and walk in the fruits of repentance as salt and light of the culture, truly loving others, when we have that vertical commitment right now, we have a horizontal commitment to others, that's the perfect image of the cross. That's how we get back to course correction. That's how when we get back to 1 Peter 2, where the Lord tells, tells us in the scripture, the government exists for the punishment of evildoers and for the reward of those who do good. 
The problem is, is when we switch good and evil and evil and good, there's only one institution that can fight that dominion battle, and that's the church. And, and here's why. Um, this will never end. It wasn't intended to end. We've got to remember, this is a theological issue. When there was a great war in heaven, if you read Revelation 12, it was between the devil and his demons. Well, he was Lucifer, and it was between him and his demons and Michael, the archangel, and, and, and the rest of the angels, and they fought, and who won? The angels, right? Well, where was the devil thrown? He was thrown to earth. Then God creates man. Where does he put man? In the exact same spot that he just put the devil. And then he tells Adam, take dominion, full well knowing that there was a devil there that was going to try to take that dominion from Adam. This fight has been going on since the creation of the first human being. It will never stop. But then God says, if you align yourself under my authority, my kingdom will come through you, which that means his comprehensive rule in every sphere of life. And when his kingdom comes through an individual, darkness has to flee. That's the, all the light has to do is show up. And when we show up, darkness then has to flee. The fight will still be on, but we can be victorious over that. So I'm not here to try to change culture. I'm here to shine the light of Jesus Christ. And it's only found in the cross of Jesus Christ. All the other stuff that we can do and talk about is going to amount to a big, hot, steaming cup of jack squat. That was a Chris Farley quote. See to it that nobody misses the grace of God, Hebrews 12, 15. Amen. Do you think that your approach unnecessarily divides the conversation so that people turn it off? In other words, the response to the Houston mayor, how best is it made from people who are walking as followers of Christ? That, that's an awesome question. Okay, and I would answer it simply like this. The same boiling water that hardens the egg softens the carrot. Most people want the temperature of the water turned down. What we have to do is look at the substance of what's in the water. Either they're going to get turned off or they're going to get turned on. If God, when Jesus showed up, either you hated him or you loved him. But there was no middle ground there because when you sit on the fence, your pants get torn. So I think that that's the way that we've well, got to and go. And if I could just jump in real quick, and I, I, I totally understand what you're saying. Uh, Peter speaks... And he and the apostles uh, in, in Jerusalem are speaking. And at Pentecost, they say, you killed Jesus. And, and, and the Bible says they were pierced to the heart. What must we do to be saved? And he says, repent of your sins. And 3,000 are added to the number. Now, just a few chapters later, same exact message, a different group of people. They pulled them out and flogged them. His message didn't change. The response was completely different on both ends. So the, the scripture says, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. Do you know the one thing about our situation with our story by God's amazing grace? Not one comment about our ways, not one, never. 51 million tweets during that uh, two week period of time, 50 media interviews, taking bullets from everywhere, not one comment about our ways, only about our words. And when the Apostle Peter was confronted with do not speak in Acts chapter 4 in the name of this Jesus anymore, he said, Lord, fill us with boldness. And that's our only prayer. Now I'm going to, and I'll provide translation for you guys later, I'm going to do a little Catholic talk here with Ross. Um, isn't this the same conversation occurring right now in the Synod as to how to approach sin? Yeah, I mean, may, maybe. Um, so, as some of you may know, there's an ongoing synod of bishops in Rome called by Pope Francis that's uh, discussing debates around the family and sexual ethics and so on. And basically, yeah, it is a version of this conversation. It's sort of what, you know, they're sort of particularly Catholic ideas about some of these issues. But the idea is sort of how do you present the gospel of Jesus Christ and particularly the gospel of Jesus Christ as it relates to marriage and family in the secular world and in a world that has this sort of assumption that these ideas are antiquated, out of date, potentially bigoted and dangerous. Um, and there's a, clear, there's a clear division within the church um, over sort of the extent to which the message can be adapted and changed and modified and reemphasized and so on in order to sort of speak to people where they are right now. 
And I think that that, you know, the outcome of that debate uh, will, will be determined. Um, and it's happening in Rome, so it's subject to 6,000 different cross-cutting rumors and uh, interesting conspiracy theories. Um, but, and the fact that there's another pope alive at the moment, it sort of adds, adds a layer of intrigue too. Um, but I think I would say that what's, what's interesting about that, that parallel is that, you know, the, the, I think a lot of, I think it's an interesting, I, I think there are a bunch of different models, basically, of Christian engagement right now. And there's a, f a form of Christian engagement that says we need to just meet the culture where they are right now. And we need to sort of, you know, maintain our ideals, but sort of accompany the culture as they are. And then there's, I think, the model that you've heard expressed very eloquently um, by these guys tonight, which is a model of conflict and conquest, basically. I think that's fair to I say. I wouldn't necessarily say conflict and confl conflict. conflict in that in that context. I would simply say that's a spiritual term because our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So right. it's not conflict and conquest, politically speaking. But it, but it, but culture is a spiritual battlefield, right? Wouldn't wouldn't you agree? I mean, when you're talking it's about the reflection when of you're a talking battle. about the idea of dominion, right? Yeah. That that idea is an idea of as you said, dominion over media, culture, government, and so on. Not dominion taken by force of arms or yeah, something. Yeah, absolutely. But, but I, I understand the distinction. But the goal is, you know, is, is the idea is that by, in a sense, standing boldly for Christ in the public square, you will... You will, you will win the culture because you will win... Can we just world. take one quick look yeah. at history real quick? Okay. The reformers, you look back at history, and let's just go back, we'll go back to 1381, John Wycliffe translates the Bible. Yeah, okay, big mistake. But let's just, hold on. So here we go. <laughs> awesome. So here, I love this, by the way. I think this is wonderful. The, the three things, and this is good, this will help, this helps me remember. Reformers restate, reaffirm, and reapply biblical truth. That's what reformers do. Non-reformers or the emergent leaders would simply reconcile the Bible to the prevailing worldview. So here comes this overwhelming worldview. We'll just call it this new sexual ethic. Let's try to meet common ground and find places where we can reconcile our faith to this prevailing worldview. That is not a biblical position. A biblical position is restate, reaffirm, reapply and let the, let the chips fall where they may. Now, of course, it has nothing to do with the way I treat you as an individual. I will always, as a good citizen of heaven, I have to be a good citizen of earth, which means to restrain evil that good may flourish. Does that make sense? It does. And I, but I, what I was going to say is that there is sort of, there is in, in a way a third model that I hear from a lot of religious believers right now um, that is somewhere in between those, those two, and that, which is basically a model of um, in a sense, a kind of, a kind of withdrawal, basically, with the idea, with, I think, the, the ultimate goal being, being the, the, the ultimate goal of Christianity, but with, with the idea that in this cultural context, in this situation right now, boldness of a certain kind effectively just brings, um, brings more pressure down on you, and the key is, in a sense, to reconstitute Christian community first. That basically yeah. we've reached a point in American society where institutional Christianity, the churches are weak enough that we need room to sort of tend our own gardens in a sense. So that's, I, I, was, I just wanted to raise that as a sort of, it, it, it's, I, 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 I think I hear it a lot and it, you know, it's behind a lot of religious movements in our own day. I think if you talk to people involved in the homeschooling movement, and I imagine there are some people in this room tonight um, who have homeschooled their children, or some of the younger among you have been homeschooled yourselves, I think that that movement springs from that kind of motivation, this sense that, you, in a sense, you need to pull out a little bit of the debate in order to rejoin it later on. Yeah, David and I, we, we um, well, I actually came up with this tweet. I'm not sure he could ever come up with something like this because I thought it was pretty good. It's actually straight from the Holy Spirit because after going through this, when we were sitting there in front of all these cameras and, and kind of explaining our position, I just remember this kind of flowed right out of my mouth, which is for sure from the Holy Spirit. Boldness apart from brokenness makes a bully on both sides. It doesn't matter which side you're on. 
If you're not broken over your own sin, you're gonna be a bully either way. That's why David and I would be the last people that would say, just stand out there and be bold. I would say, no, you'd be broken. And on the foundation of your brokenness, guess what happens? You're filled with humility because you know you're an idiot. And you know that that person that you're looking at that's talking in a way you're like, man, what, that, a rational human being wouldn't think like you. You actually feel love for that person. And when you feel love for that person, you can distinguish between the idea that person has and their person. And when that happens, now you can have a clash of ideas. I can take your thought captive and I can make that thought obedient to Christ because when someone says that a man and a man can get married and that's good family, that's not good family. And I can tell you, no, that's not good family. Hey, you wanna go get a burger? Because personally, on a personal level, I love you, but I'm not gonna tolerate that idea. That's good boldness and that's biblical boldness. And last, a last question before we <laughs> get your arms around this, take your time answering it. I, I am not at all certain which approach is better for the gospel? Because I see two approaches. Uh, we have an elite opinion maker, influencer, who is working within and is read widely by uh, the 5,000 people that Mark Halpern say run the country. And we have cultural icons who appeal to, um, and Peter Berger said, if Sweden is the least religious country in the world and India is the most country, religious country in the world, the United States is a nation of Indians ruled by Swedes. And so you guys are talking to the, you're talking to the Texans right now. And, you're, and, and you will have an audience forever because you paid a price. Um, I'm not sure which is better for the present viability of this republic uh, in terms of, of allowing it to function. I don't know if sending you guys out like the Marines to take the cultural hill or Ross withdraw, retreat, establish defensible lines and renew yourself. I didn't, I didn't, associate, my, I didn't associate myself with that, that kind of cowardice, Hugh. No, no, I, was just putting, I was just putting it out there, you know, the hypothetical. Churchill refused to invade Europe in 42, 43, and he kept saying, I'm going to build gonna... a real nice monastery, <laughs> yeah. and you're going to be welcome anytime. <laughs> there you <Right>. go. <laughs> so I, just, I would just like you guys to, to, to tell us what you think. People who are here and people who are watching ought to do about the Houston mayor. I want to bring it back to this is a real controversy. Um, ought they to walk away? Ought they to go and, you know, A, I want them to support ADF, supporting those, those pastors. But what ought those pastors to do? if they want to both represent Jesus, preserve religious freedom, and make sure that their church doesn't cower. Because that example that emerges from Houston is going to have a profound impact on churches across the United States. So I'll start at this end and come this way. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> um, Throw you a curve, Brian. I thought you could hit curves. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. You said that. Yeah. Uh, again, it goes back to 2 Chronicles 7.14. Again, this is the answer for our culture today. 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Now, he started with humble. Humility, seeing yourself through the lens of who God is and who you are in relation to him. Now, sheep looks white until it snows. Then it looks pretty dirty. So we look pretty good when we compare ourselves with each other or compare ourselves with ourselves. But then once we look at God and we say, wow, I'm just seeing your pinky toe and I want to fall down. Then we realize, we, we realize how bad we truly are. So we get to that point first. And on that brokenness and that repentance then there's a boldness that comes over us. So what I would say to the pastors in Houston, first, be broken. Because if you don't feel love for a fellow human being, which I'm sure that most of them do, don't say anything. You'll just be a rattling gong and just a, a resounding cymbal. And you don't want to be like that. And then I would say, be willing to pay whatever the price is, whatever the cost. We have a book coming out February 10th called Whatever the Cost. And this is an opportunity where these pastors get, get, get to show all of us how they're willing to hold their church with an open hand. When God gives you something and you hold it with an open hand, he can take it in and he can remove it as much as he wants to. But the minute you clinch it, then he's got to pry your fingers loose. And that process is an awful, awful process. And so holding that church with that open hand and saying, I will stand whatever the cost. Guess who smiles at that? God Almighty, the one that knows exactly how many hairs you have on your head. 
the one that knew you before you were even conceived in your mother's womb. That God will smile on that type of attitude. So he's speaking strategically. I'll bring it down technically to the specific uh, issue of, of the pastors. Uh, I see it from two perspectives, a spiritual perspective first and then a political perspective. Second, from a spiritual perspective, I'd give my sermons to the mayor. I'd give my sermons. I'd give everything to everyone all the time, and I'd speak boldly what God says about marriage. But they subpoenaed marriage. their I, private conversations now, with now, but So, so politically speaking, absolutely not. I mean, I would take a very strong stand because protecting our religious liberty is vitally important in this nation. So that's what I'm saying is that I think they absolutely ought to stand. And, and in order to stand strong, I mean, they're going to have to consider the cost. And that's kind of getting back to his strategic analogy there about you have to hold it with an open hand. You may lose congregants. You may get smeared in the media. You may be called all these terrible names and, and lose some of the ground that your ministry has gained in the city. But you know what? It doesn't really matter. And I truly, I believe, spiritually speaking, they'll gain far more ground when they stand strong. And I would have a press conference with a bunch of the pastors dressed like the village people. I would probably do that. Ross? Um, I... <laughs> Sorry. It's okay, I've just lost whatever thought was ever in my head. Um, no, I guess I'd just bring it back to sort of where you started and say, you know, look, we're, we're, in, we're in a dynamic um, in American politics and culture where, again, we're talking about, for religious conservatives, conservative Christians, we're talking about pressure. We're not talking about persecution. And as long as we're talking about pressure, then we're talking about a battlefield where you want to fight the strongest battle in the legal realm that you possibly can. And, um, you know, we're, I mean, I think the fact that a group like ADF wins so many cases is a sign that those battles are worth fighting. Um, and so that's sort of a case, in a way, against a lot of different, it's a case against just sort of withdrawing, it's a case against seeing things in overly apocalyptic terms. There are battles that are lost, um, and you have to accept they're lost, and when you, when you lose battles outright, then you have to talk about, you know, do you withdraw, do you confront, what do you do then? But in battles that are live battles in the legal system, and a battle over, you know, subpoenas by, by a mayor of private conversations is going to be a live battle, you just fight, you fight that battle legally to the best, you know, the, and, you don't, and you don't give your political opponents reason to say, look at these crazy religious people, sort of, you know, they, they aren't, they can't even work within our laws and our legal system. Where you have a working legal system and working laws, you work within those laws and you work at it, you know, the way you're supposed to in court, as you know, you know well. You work it better than the other side and you win. I want uh, to thank all three of our panelists and uh, would you please join me in doing that as they exit and I introduce our next person. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Now, it's awfully hard to get enduring sympathy for the Benham brothers when you're that tall and you've got the big jaw and you figure that uh, they're going to have, they're going to have a terrific future and a great bestseller and Janet will interview them and I'll interview them and they'll be out there forever and, and Ross has got locked down. It's very hard to actually worry about me or any of these people when they've got a position of leverage within a community of believers that support them both in their personal life and their family life and at pulpits and places like this. But some people who fight this fight don't get the glad that, you know, the square jaw and they don't get the, the circulation of the New York Times and they don't get 100 radio stations or a massive audience. They fight alone and they fight in amazing ways and I'd like to show you a video about one of them and then introduce you to her. This is my, oh, this is my treasure. Oh. I have one for Brinton and New Haven, Missouri and Edison, Pennsylvania, Birmingham, Alabama. This one is from Sri Lanka, India and it was a minister who was on a train who met an American who had an article about Arlene's flowers. I see calls every week and just says, how are you doing, sister? And then I got the Bible from a church in Yakima that came down, and they came to the shop and uh, just 
they said they were behind us and that they were thinking of us and very, very special. We just want to do something out of the ordinary. Something that tickles somebody's fancy or makes them smile or whatever. Just get these ideas in your head and, and uh, you really can't describe them. You know, I don't have a I don't have a theory about it or anything. I just do it. Well, I think most artistic people, you know, especially painters, I think they put their heart into their arrangements. It's part of them. It's part of who they are. And I think that's the same thing with a florist. The joy of being here so long is you get to know people personally. I don't consider the people that walk in the door customers. They're just people that want something to please somebody else, and that's my job. She is the most kind, gentlest soul you'll ever meet. If you go into her shop, you're going to get a hug. And so she's very warm. And she had established a really warm relationship with Rob Ingersoll, um, who had been in nine years and would come in and spend a good amount of money throughout the year. And they had gotten to know each other pretty well. He has a very creative mind, and so we just sort of hit it off. At one point, he decided to get married a few months after same-sex marriage became legal in Washington State. And he, of course, wanted her to do it. That was a real struggle to, to decide what to do with that. My husband and I talked it over, and, you know, as much as I love Rob, I just couldn't, couldn't be a part of that. If I did Rob's wedding, it would be from my heart, because I, I think he's a really special person, and I would want to make it really special for him. So it wasn't something that I flippantly said, oh, I'm not going to do Rob's wedding because he's gay. When I talked to Rob, I did not think this would be a, a major issue. I was very surprised at that. The Attorney General's action in this case is unprecedented in Washington State. We have never had an Attorney General take the position that this Attorney General has taken. Now the ACLU's piled on and the same-sex couple have sued her as well. And interestingly, um, they have sued her in her personal capacity as well as her business. So she is at great risk. As a result of serving someone lovingly and admittedly in a kind way for nine years and because you won't do one same-sex wedding, you're going to lose your house or your business. And she's been working in this business for 40 years. I've read a lot of hate mail over the years, but what I've read in this case just is stunning. It's so, it makes you sick to your stomach when just volumes after volumes, thousands of pages. People are filled with hate and refuse to even listen to what the real story is and how angry and frustrated and it's just so sad. This is about marriage. It's not about bigotry. She knew of their relationship. They provided, she provided flowers that they sent to each other. But when it came to marriage, that was the line. Because as she'll tell you, marriage represents the relationship of Christ and his church. It's a sacred covenant. Marriage is a sacred, very sacred thing. You want flowers for your anniversary or your birthday or whatever, that's fine. But I just cannot do a same-sex marriage. So this case in particular is coercing someone to engage in expression. And that's against America's tradition, and it's unconstitutional. It's also unnecessary. There are lots of florists. If you look in the Tri-Cities area, there's like three pages in the yellow pages of florists that could have served this couple. Um, they've even admitted that after they received enough offers for free wedding arrangements to do 20 different weddings. But yet, what's being set up here is that's not good enough. It's not good enough that there are other florists. We have to coerce everyone to do what we want them to do, even if it violates religious convictions. I have to have faith that he's going to 
protect me and uh, give me the courage and the knowledge and the wisdom to, to stand firm on this. But uh, also help me understand what obedience is and what, I'm going to cry, <clears throat> and what following Christ is. You, know, you, can't, you can't sit on the fence, like he says, you can't be lukewarm. And that's what I was, I was lukewarm. There now, God bless you, sister. We are all praying for you. Stand with you 100%, Pastor Tony. God will hold your hand no matter what. God bless Opal. I will certainly continue to pray for you and thank you for your commitment. Lord bless Dan Greer. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God bless you, Cheryl Sampson. Rest in Jesus, you're a daughter of the King. That one got me. May God's strength be with you, praying for you. David family. Hope all goes well. Just remember God loves you. Katie Casper. Now that is a uh, moving video because it's a story of courage and of faith, and I'd like you to welcome Baron L so she can talk to you herself. Thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, this is a pretty overwhelming experience for Daryl and I, and excuse me. God has put us in a special place, and we are, we are truly blessed. If it weren't for Daryl and ADF and Kristen and Dale and John and the staff and the media and the countless hours of volunteer attorneys like Alicia Berry, we would have already been buried by now. What is amazing is that you give me a standing ovation for standing up for Christ and my own personal thoughts and my mentor. Why would we not stand up and say something? I ask for prayers for ADF, for our judges, our court dates, for Rob and Kurt, the people who are suing us, and for Christians to take a stand. It's me today but it'll be you tomorrow if you just sit quietly. They can destroy me, but they can't destroy my God, and they can't destroy his word. We already read ahead and know how this will end. God will not be mocked. I am but one voice. You have a voice. Thank you. Now you're a great American. Thank you so much. I, um, I was a young lawyer in the Reagan White House when Mother Teresa received the Medal of Freedom. And she came to the White House to receive it. And if you were a young lawyer, you could go in the Rose Garden and watch the ceremony. So I was over there. Uh, and I did that with great joy. And the uh, president came out of the Oval Office, followed by this very small saint. I mean, she's tiny. She's not this high. And, um, the Gipper gave a great set of remarks, as he always did, honoring her. And he took the Medal of Freedom, which is the highest civilian honor. It's got to be voted on by Congress, and put it around uh, the little saint's neck and said, Mother Teresa, would you like to say a few words? She said yes. And so he took the microphone. He bent it down to her. And she looked up at him and said, Mr. President, I need more money. <laughs> Since I've heard that, I've never hesitated to tell people <clears throat> when I raise money for various organizations, whether it's Young Life or a political candidate or tonight, Alliance Defending Freedom, that if you know the money's going to good work, you, you give joyfully. Um, we have a donor at ADF. Tonight's a paid event. Thank you for coming and paying. But we have a donor for ADF who's agreed that uh, 
Every dollar that any of you feel inclined to pledge tonight, and there's a, in your program an opportunity to do that, they will match that uh, because they're so invested in the work of defending people like Baronell, like our pastors in Houston, like everyone who is colliding in this massive confrontation that don't have the resources or the platforms that Ross or Hugh or the brothers have. So uh, I'm going to invite Lance Bozeman to come up and tell you a little bit more about how to do that. But I do want to encourage you to the extent you've been moved by this or just by that simple and extraordinary grace of Baronell uh, to be generous tonight.